Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to see you all here. I am delighted to address the Oslo Freedom Forum. This forum has evolved into a crucially important event, well reflected in the impressive participation that it gathers from around the world. I would start by thanking Tor Halvorsen and his team for creating this arena to discuss the most important human rights uh, issues of our time. And thank you very much for choosing to convene in Oslo. My first message to you is that we are with you. Promoting freedom, human rights, democracy and the rule of law is at the very top of Norway's foreign policy agenda. It matters in all aspects and all respects of what we do in my ministry and in my government. Our engagement in this area is both a reflection of solidarity and of self-interest. As a small but globally engaged country, we firmly believe that living in a world that respects the fundamental principles of human rights is good for us, as it is good for everyone else on this planet. Just as we need international law to regulate relations between countries, we need human rights standards to regulate relations between states and their citizens. This spring has been particularly intense in our human rights diplomacy. We see, as I also saw from your own pamphlet presenting the conference, contradicting tendencies as we are living to, through a time of transition of fundamental global shifts. At the very same, same time, we see clear signs of progress and of significant backsliding, both are true at the same time. At times, we find that principles and stances we used to take for granted are challenged, even when we thought they were solidly respected. Some debates, like the debate about freedom, human rights, have to be run over and over again. Just as we are beginning to grasp the realities of a 21st century world, new dilemmas emerge, and all themes are reintroduced in new settings. Hence, we need a truly global dialogue about human rights. Promoting human rights for all requires us all to take a stance. It means that we must be willing to stand up and speak up and to make our values clear, even when it's uncomfortable, just as you do in this conference. But there is more. It is also about engaging and sometimes entiring long-term processes in bilateral or multilateral processes in order to promote change. Norway seeks to promote global respect for human rights through multilateral as well as bilateral channels. Allow me to use my own human rights related program over only the last six weeks to illustrate the work that is taking place on the multilateral front. These are but a few examples, but they can help guide my speech today. Firstly, on the 21st of March, a landmark resolution on the protection of human rights defenders was passed in the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva after tough negotiations led by Norway. Every day, individual human rights defenders are being prosecuted, organizations dissolved, companies taken to court and media silenced. All this simply for asking the wrong questions, claiming legitimate rights, or upholding the rights of others. Why is this particular UN resolution important? To begin with, it is the strongest and most substantial resolution in this field ever. It clarifies the obligation of states to protect human rights defenders and to refrain from activities that hinder their legitimate work. This resolution thus creates an important tool for defenders on the ground in the countries where they work. The resolution is living proof that it's still possible to agree on important normative texts in the UN. But as we all know, a resolution, of course, does not change the world. But these texts may be used to put pressure on governments to live up to what they have signed on to. This, in turn, can be the work of engaged NGOs, of journalists, or peer governments. At the same time, I'm the first one to admit that working through the UN may also entail challenges to those of us who work for human rights for all, and the same rights for all. Some member states have recently launched what they refer to as the 
traditional values agenda. The argument goes that there are some so-called traditional values that should trump basic human rights. The argument goes fundamentally against the principle of universality of human rights. Similarly, we see how conservative voices joining forces across nations and faiths to counter the progress made over the last half century, for instance, on gender equality, rights of women, and the sexual and reproductive rights. Again, some struggles have to be fought over and over again. At the same time, it's good that the people who have these beliefs, which I do not, believe, which I do not share, actually take them to global fora. That means we can meet them and confront them and disagree in the open arena. It is my conviction that we need these platforms in order to deal with global issues. If the rules are not good enough, let's strengthen them. If the rules are not respected, let's claim their respect. Let me move to the next item on the list. Secondly, nor in April, Norway hosted the European Regional Conference for the International Labour Organization. The topic was jobs, growth and social justice. And workers' rights, rights are also human rights. The conference called for the creation of quality jobs, improving social dialogue and respecting labor rights at a time where many countries all over the world, and not the least in Europe, are struggling to overcome the current economic crisis without destroying the existing social fa fabric. Thirdly, in mid-April, Norway hosted an unprecedented international conference on human rights sexual orientation and gender identity, together with South Africa here in Oslo. More than 200 representatives of states and civil society organizations from 84 countries came together and discussed the specific human rights challenges faced by sexual minorities. Human rights for all is the doctrine we base our work on, not human rights for some or some human rights, but human rights for all people all the time. It's a simple doctrine yet incredibly difficult to achieve. Even in this context, the UN has a key role to play. Together with key states and strong partners in civil society, Norway hopes for a breakthrough in the Human Rights Council in the follow-up of this LGBT conference. Fourthly, on the list, on the same day, 15th of April, the International Commission Against the Death Penalty convened here in Oslo and launched their report, How States Abolish the Death Penalty. Drawing on concrete experiences from 13 countries that have taken steps to abolish the death penalty, the report provides a guide to countries that wish to follow these steps, of those, follow the steps of those states that have already stopped killing in the name of justice. We now gear up for the World Congress against the death penalty in Madrid in June, where Norway is one of the co-organizers. And also in this field, we see contradicting trends. More and more countries abolish the death penalty, but those who keep it kill more people. So this is a contradicting trend again. Fifthly, today, on this very day, we have another conference uh, called Right-Wing Extremism and Hate Crime, Minorities Under Pressure in Europe and Beyond, just across the street here. Human rights are under pressure even in Europe. We are seeing worrying signs in a number of countries. The fact that people were marching against the World Jewish Congress in Budapest from the Jobbik party is but one example of that. Pressure on minorities, extremism and hate crime is on the rise in parts of Europe. This is often, the argument is that this is often linked to the financial and social crisis at play in many European countries and the lessons of the 1930s are, is invoked. True, but we must remember that people are individually responsible for their actions and their beliefs and free to choose their opinion. There is no, automa there's no automaticity between economic distress and the need to speak out against a minority from the side of the majority. And these are important issues to put on the agenda because they, these are principles that are in peril. Freedom of expression and the role of the media is on that agenda as it is also on your agenda here. Freedom of expression is a fundamental right. Freedom of expression is essential for the realization of other rights and freedoms. And freedom of expression not only allows people to express themselves freely, but is also necessary in order to foster mutual understanding and tolerance, democratic processes, good governance and conflict resolution, as well as other types of development. Freedom, however, is not for free. It comes with certain responsibilities. 
limits, limits on the direct incitement of violence and murder are necessary in a democratic society. Drawing the borders between the absolute principle of freedom of speech and the need to protect all the democratic values is an extremely difficult task. And a lot of us policymakers are faced with that almost on a daily basis. Where do we draw the lines between mutually, clearly desirable outcomes? Hate speech are haunting our social media arenas. Racism and other abuse is frequent. My view is that hate speech, first and foremost, must be met by opposition. That's a duty for all, government, civil society, media, individual citizens. The silent majority sometimes have to speak up. It may be uncomfortable, but silence can at times be confused with endorsement. And sixth on my list, on Tuesday, Thursday this week, I will attend the ministerial meeting of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. Again, a European topic. And the reason I keep mentioning European examples is that even in this continent, that many people associate with well-established principles and rights uh, of, of individuals, we see severe challenges. The topic of the Council of Europe meeting is democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in Europe. And the topic is to explore how European countries and regional organizations can best tackle the growing challenges on our own continent. A key theme is how the Council of Europe, an institution that, at least on paper, has some of the strongest human rights instruments available, can put them to better use in an era where some of the key principles of the organization are challenged, even among its own member states. To conclude, these are just but a few examples of the last, six last weeks of an ongoing active multilateral diplomacy for human rights. Uh, our purpose is to pursue these issues wherever, whenever, and in everybody's interest. But this is only half the story. We also need to have a strong emphasis on human rights at the country level, what we call the bilateral level. Our embassies around the world are instructed to focus on human rights in their daily work, not only in theory, but in practice. In order to assist them in their daily business, we have issued clear guidelines for our foreign service about how best to support human rights defenders in practice, meeting them, supporting them, making them visible, work with them. We have also issued specific guidelines for our efforts against the death penalty, against the discrimination of religious minorities, as well as the mentioned topic of lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and trans persons. Friends, as I said at the outset, to stand up for our values and to speak up when somebody's rights are violated is an intrinsic part of protecting human rights. But human rights diplomacy must be more than just speaking up, shouting loud, and pointing fingers. We always have to look at what actually works how we can do the best possible job to promote human rights, and where and how we can achieve concrete results. It is, after all, relatively easy for us to write press releases, but it's more difficult to impose our will on others. That's where our challenge lies. We must speak out clearly about unacceptable breaches of human rights, but we also need to engage with governments in order to inspire, support, change where it is possible. And my experience, is that by holding governments accountable to the obligations they themselves have undertaken by entering into global or regional human rights instruments works much better than the argument that I happen to know better than you. Promoting human rights is about meeting countries with unsatisfactory human rights records on the international arena or in bilateral encounters. At times, it's about offering support, such as aid to constitutional processes, security sector reform, and strengthening the rule of law. These are, after all, the very arenas where key human rights principles are either upheld or violated. And finally, it's about finding the entry points and exploring our ability to make a difference in each individual context. Not, there's not one size fits all. With this Norwegian perspective on uh, how a small but active state can work to promote human rights, I wish you a very constructive dialogue and very concrete results here at the Oslo Freedom Forum. Thank you very much for your attention.